America's town meeting is on the air. Welcome once again to historic town hall in New York City and another free discussion by free American citizens. The meeting, as usual, will be conducted by our moderator, Mr. George V. Denny, Jr., president of town hall and founder and director of America's town meeting of the air, Mr. Denny. Good evening, neighbors. Do we have a free press or don't we? And what do we mean by a free press? Propaganda Minister Goebbels of Germany once said, the press must be the keyboard on which the government can play. That doesn't sound like American philosophy, does it? In our definition of democracy, which I've given you from this platform before, we concluded by saying that democracy presupposes a system of universal education and the dissemination of unbiased news and information on a basis which will permit of an honestly informed public opinion. The new instrument of warfare in the world today is propaganda. And the most difficult kind of propaganda to detect is that which masquerades as news and information and is disseminated among the people by word of mouth, in the press, on the radio, screen, and magazine. We've discussed this subject in several previous programs. More recently, on our third program this fall, under the title, What Do We Mean by Free Speech? Tonight, we attack the problem from another angle. Under the subject, do we have a free press? As pointed out by Mr. Arthur Robb in his address last fall, the right of freedom of the press carries with it the privilege of being wrong. He also pointed out that this did not apply to the practice known as coloring the news or editorializing in the news columns. I believe this thesis is generally accepted by the newspaper world. It is a part of our tradition, however, for newspapers to lean toward or champion one party, group, or certain individuals at election time and oppose others. The extent to which a paper advocates one party or group in America is entirely under present conditions within the discretion of the newspaper owners or publishers. But what are the forces to which the publisher is subjected? Is there a threat of government censorship? Must he cater to the wishes or demands of his advertisers? To what extent do local politics interfere with his complete freedom? Newspapers play such an important part in our daily life that it behooves us to examine this subject frankly, frankly and honestly in true town meeting fashion. We are honored this evening to have as our speakers a high government official, member of the President's Cabinet, the Honorable Harold L. Ickes, Secretary of Interior, and the owner and publisher of a chain of American newspapers, Mr. Frank E. Gannett. Following their addresses, we'll have the usual question period. It's now my pleasure to present our first speaker, the Honorable Harold L. Ickes, Secretary of Interior. Mr. Ickes. <laughs> Mr. Gannett, ladies and gentlemen, have we a free press in the United States? It is as free as it wishes to be. So far as government control is concerned, the American press is free. No federal law, no state law interferes with it. As a matter of fact, the American government annually pays an enormous subsidy to the press in the form of less than cost postage rates. This subsidy amounted to some $90 million the last fiscal year. Yet while the American press is free so far as the government is concerned, it is nevertheless far from free. In 1924, William Randolph Hearst admitted that the influence of the press was declining, I quote, because so many newspapers are owned or influenced by reactionary interests and predatory corporations and are used selfishly to promote the welfare of those reactionary interests rather than the welfare of the public. And the late Arthur Bisbane said, newspaper success today means great wealth, and the rich man, 99 times out of 100, lets his money think for him. There are men owning newspapers in this country who could not be bribed by any amount of money outside of their own pocket. But the money in their pockets edits their editorial columns every day. There are several great newspapers in the United States for which I have a profound admiration. 
but even they are not wholly free. Their vast financial investment running high into the millions binds them closely to the business world from which they draw their sustenance. Freedom is impossible even for a publisher with a sense of civic responsibility or an editor with noble ideals when the counting office holds the whip hand. The nearest approach to a free press in the United States will be found in the small town newspaper which does not owe money at the bank. The freest editor I know is William Allen White of the Emporia Candace Gazette. If he were speaking with me tonight, it would not be a debate because both of us would be on the same side. William Allen White knows that the press is not free. He has said so. I am glad that I am to discuss this question with Mr. Craig e. Gannett, owner of a chain of 19 newspapers and three radio stations. At first, I was sorry that Colonel... <laughs> At first, I was sorry that Colonel Robert R. McCormick of the Chicago Tribune had, characteristically, refused to share the platform with me. <laughs> it is understandable why the morning Colonel of Chicago should be reluctant to defend his publication against the frequently made charge that it is the lowest form of newspaper life. <laughs> Mr. Gannett ranks above the average among <laughs> American publishers. Therefore, if it can be shown that freedom of the press does not exist for the Gannett newspapers, any conclusions drawn from that fact may fairly be applied to the American press generally. What are the chief accusations which the American people make against the American press? First, that it has financial affiliations or is subject to financial pressures which limit its freedom. Metropolitan newspapers in particular are part of the financial oligarchy that is trying to rule America. Second, that it is subject to the influence of advertisers, causing omission, distortion, or improper slanting of news and affecting its editorial opinions. Third, that it is unfair to certain groups of citizens, especially working men, whose interests conflict with those of the newspaper or its financial backers or its advertisers. In the few minutes at my disposal, I cannot begin to cover the subject, even in relation to the Gannett newspapers. On another occasion, I hope that I will have sufficient time to present the great mass of material that I have. First, let us consider secret financial entanglements in and outside controls. The Federal Trade Commission has reported the amazing story of a propaganda fund amounting to $25 million a year, by means of which the power interests had filled the newspapers of the country with articles and editorials hostile to government ownership of public utilities and opposing public development of water power. when water power is a good thing. <laughs> Incidentally, the man who was in charge of the distribution of this propaganda money was Merlin A. Aylesworth, now the publisher of the New York World Telegram. The Federal Trade Commission also disclosed that the power companies were buying concealed financial control of newspapers all over the country or were making secret loans large enough to bring the publisher under the thumb of the powerful utility interests. I shall cite one item. In April 1929, the Federal Trade Commission found that the International Power and Paper Company, a half-billion-dollar corporation which derives from 65 to 75 percent of its revenue from the sale of power, owned all of the preferred stock and 30 percent of the common stock of the Knickerbocker Press and the Albany Evening News, as well as a sizable share of the Ithaca, New York, Journal News. These new papers were, and still are, Gannett properties. Following this disclosure, Mr. Gannett hastened to refinance. 
I ask you, during the time that this paper and power company had a very large interest in the Gannett newspapers, was Mr. Gannett free? Was he free to discuss any question affecting the wood pulp or the water power industry on its merits? Did he tell his readers when he wrote editorials against government ownership of power that he was in hock to the power interests? <laughs> if Mr. Gannett had not regarded this as a questionable connection, why was he in such a hurry to refinance after the government disclosure? It may be claimed that Mr. Gannett simply has a peculiar modesty about disclosing his financial backers. The same trait was to show itself later when he was asked to tell who were, show who were showering money upon his national committee to uphold constitutional government. Now for the second item in the indictment brought by the people against the American press, that it is subject to the influence of the advertisers, or rather of advertising, since this influence is usually impersonal. This is a fact so well known that it hardly needs discussion. If you should go to a working newspaper man and say to him, newspapers are not influenced by advertising, are they? He would be likely to reply, where have you been since you learned to read? <laughs> I wish that I had time to place before you even a small fraction of the evidence that exists of the control of the press, not by the direct demand of advertisers, but the indirect control that does not have to be put in words. I ask any person listening to me, did you ever read a story in a newspaper about an elevator accident in a department store? that was written and displayed on the basis of its news value? Of course not. And you have never read anything in a newspaper about the low wages of retail clerks, except in 10 cent stores, and they don't advertise. <laughs> the suppression and distortion of news for fear of losing advertising is one of the gravest crimes against our democracy. It is not easy to put your finger upon violation of the principle of the free press by the methods commonly employed, suppression and distortion of news, playing it down, burying it back of the want ads, or use of misleading headlines. Occasionally, however, outside control comes out into the open. This happened in the unscrupulous campaign of the patent medicine interest and the manufacturers of poisonous cosmetics to prevent the passage of the amended Pure Food and Drug Act. When this bill was introduced in Congress in 1933, the advertising agencies of the country sent out orders to newspaper publishers to get busy and kill the proposed legislation. And the newspapers vied with each other to see which could show the most devotion to the makers of impure drugs and poisonous cosmetics. I wonder if Mr. Gannett will tell you the part he played in that at that time. Early in the campaign, he published a full-page ad announcement that his newspapers had placed a speaker against the bill on the program of the New York State Federation of Women's Clubs. Why did he do this? It was good business. Never fear that full-page advertisement undoubtedly was mailed to every big advertising agency and every big cosmetic and drug advertiser in the country. And Mr. Gannett, I repeat, ranks above the average among American newspaper publishers. Now for the third charge against the American press, that it abuses its freedom by discriminating against groups of citizens not powerful enough to defend their rights. A few days ago, I received a letter from a resident of Rochester, New York. It told how, during a bakery strike in 1937, the Gannett papers refused to take the case of the striking bakers. Finally, the union decided to run a paid ad. This was flatly refused by the Gannett management. Now, just before this, during the auto workers' strike in Detroit, both Gannett papers in Rochester ran full-page ads giving the General Motors version of that strike. 
This is how the American press uses the freedom which is guaranteed to it by the Constitution and which the taxpayers subsidize to the tune of $90 million a year. General Motors may state its case. Union Bakers may not. But if you should ask the publishers of American newspapers whether distortion or suppression occurs or whether headlines reflect bias, with honorable exceptions, they would answer, Oh, no, no, indeed. On this subject of the rejection of advertising by newspapers, I should like to mention the case of George Selby's recent book, Lords of the Press, a well-documented indictment of certain newspaper publishers and their practices, a book, by the way, that all should read. The New York Herald Tribune refused an advertisement of this book, and most other newspapers refused to review it. Another indictment of our plutocracy met with a similar fate. I quote from a letter from William A. Green of the New York Herald Tribune to William Gowan of the Hudson Advertising Company of New York City. Mr. Green said, The censorship department of the Herald Tribune has decided that they will take no more advertising copy on the book America's 60 Family. Mr. Gannett himself criticized President Roosevelt for his assertion, I have always been firmly persuaded that our newspapers cannot be edited in the interest of the general public from the counting room. Yet in the same statement in which he criticized the President, Mr. Gannett admitted that, I quote, a generation ago when newspapers were weak financially and living from hand to mouth, all sorts of subsidies were accepted to keep the paper going. This is a significant admission. I wonder whether Mr. Gannett can distinguish between an outright subsidy and domination by advertisers. Recently, Mr. Gannett sent a questionnaire to the editors of all daily newspapers in the United States asking them 11 questions about freedom of the press. The answers were intended to confound me tonight. I assume that they will be used if they came in favorably. <laughs> Some of the editors sent their replies to me instead of to Mr. Gannett. <laughs> Incidentally, asking me to keep their names secret. So great is their fear of, of the big interests whom Mr. Gannett is known to represent. From lack of time, I'm going to read you how only one of these editors answered Mr. Gannett's questionnaire so that you may draw a distinction between an honest and civic-spirited journalist and the time service. I have no doubt that Mr. Gannett, if it serves his purpose, will announce the pious self-serving replies that he must have received from other members of his packed jury. Question number one. Do you feel that news handling on your paper is influenced by business office ideas? This is question number one of, by Mr. Gannett. Answer. Positively, yes. Otherwise, we would go out of business. Number two. Is the editorial policy of your paper dictated by business considerations? Certainly. Does your paper attempt to handle political news thoroughly and regardless of your editorial policy? No, we dare not. Question six. Are headlines slanted toward, edito toward editorial policy of your paper? Answer, yes, where business interests are involved. Number seven. Do you think newspapers are better or worse than when you first began newspaper work? work? They are worse journalistically. Do advertisers influence your editorial policy or news policy? in almost all instances. Number nine, do you suppress news of any kind because of outside pressure? Frequently, we are forced to suppress editorials and news. Number 10, with your experience, do you feel that our newspaper's first considerations are to the public welfare? No, their first consideration is income. Number 11, do you think we have a free press in America? Answer. Collectively, no. A few papers are free, 
especially if free of debt, metropolitan newspapers serve their financial masters. Let me call attention to the remarkable fact that Mr. Gannett's questionnaire in all his several, uh, 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 to a remarkable fact about Mr. Gannett's questionnaire. In all his 11 questions, there was not one on whether freedom of the press had been denied or restricted by the government. You would naturally suppose that to be the matter of interest, especially if you recall how the American Newspaper Publishers Association raved about freedom of the press when the government undertook to stop the exploitation of child labor and to protect the rights of reporters to bargain collectively for a civilized standard of wages and hours. Yet Mr. Gannett asked not one question about the attitude of government toward freedom of the press. Why? Is it because he knows, as Mr. Chester H. Rowell, one of the outstanding editors of America, has expressed it, that if there is any danger to the freedom of the American press, that danger is internal. Against repeated and continuous violation of the freedom of the press by the publishers, the government can do nothing. The Supreme Court has upheld the right of newspaper editorial workers to organize for collective bargaining, but do the newspapers tell the American people how they are defying that Supreme Court decision today? Have you read recently in the newspapers how employees of William Randolph Hearst broke the heads of reporters and editors in the greatest newspaper strike that has ever occurred in the city of Chicago? There isn't one person in a hundred in the United States who even knows that such a strike is going on. I do wish to emphasize that it is not my intention to bring an indictment against the press as a whole, but I charge, and the record will bear me out, that while as to the government re regulation and control, the press of America is free, it is not because of its own financial and economic tie-ups what it should be, a free servant of a free democracy. The lack of a free press in America is the most serious threat confronting our democratic government and our social order. It appears to be up to the publishers, through Mr. Gannett, to tell us how to free our press from the shackles that they and the financial power of private interests have put upon it. In the remaining minute, I would like to speak of a letter that came to me by special delivery air mail just before I left my hotel. It was from a citizen who lives near Ithaca, New York. He sent me a newspaper clipping, and in his letter, he referred to the fact that Mr. Gannett, a little over a year ago, entered into a debate before this same audience with uh, one of the farm leaders of the country, Mr. O'Neill, Edward O'Neill of Illinois. And his Ithaca paper, in reporting that debate, had a solid column and a half of Mr. Gannett's remarks and had no single reference to Mr. O'Neill. <laughs> Thank you. one thing the audience present and the audience listening can be sure of, and that is that the speakers didn't exchange manuscripts before this discussion. <laughs> Mr. Gannett, the microphone is yours. I take pleasure in presenting the owner and publisher of the Gannett newspaper chain, Mr. Frank E. Gannett. Thank you all for this cordial reception. <clears throat> As Mr. Denny... I did not see Mr. Icky's manuscript before I came here. 
If I had seen it, I would have given a good and sufficient answer to every one of the unfair charges that he's made against me. I was warned that I might expect just such an attack as has been made upon me. I came here... I came here to debate the question, have we a free press, and not to engage in any personal... Please let me go on. The time is precious. Do we have a free press? Emphatically, yes. But we must understand a few essentials. First, what is a free press? Historically and fundamentally, merely a press free from governmental domination or censorship. Given this freedom, one need fear no other form of press control. (laughs) But of late, some have tried to claim other forms of control, like the speaker before me. I deny this claim, and I maintain that our press as a whole is not controlled by outside interests. Still further, there is a difference between a free press and a fair press. Yet I shall show that our press is both fair and free within the limits of human fallibility. A press free from government dictation is vital to our form of government. The first article in the Bill of Rights provides for it. Newspaper men did not put it there. Press freedom is not primarily a grant to newspaper men or to printers. It is the basic right of the people to know. Framers of our Constitution demanded it because they knew from bitter experience that popular rule is impossible without full freedom to criticize government in print as well as in speech. They knew that in Europe, when men criticized the government, they had their tongues slipped, their ears cut off, were imprisoned and fiendishly tortured. Our forefathers wanted to be secure against such government suppression of the voice of the people. Get it? I'm sorry, we must pause now. Because other net, other chain, other stations are joining this network at exactly 10 o'clock. Pause just a moment for station identification. This is America's town meeting of the air held in Town Hall, New York City. This is America's town meeting of the air, continuing a discussion in Town Hall in New York on the subject, Do We Have a Free Press? The Secretary of the Interior, Harold L. Ickes, has just spoken... We have introduced Mr. Frank E. Gannett, who has just begun his speech. Mr. Gannett. Growing in strength, newspapers added to their achievements. They fought wrongs, overthrew corrupt bosses, drove incompetent men from office, unseated governors and senators, saved the Constitution again and again. When corrupt men are exposed, they always retort by attempting to smear the press. Yet the newspapers continue to fight corruption, vigilant in protecting public interest and fighting evil. And with what, and with what courage and valor editors have fought. Their plants have been bombed and burned. They have been punished and shot. And yet editors have gone on under stress and strain to protect and serve their readers. Knowing no master but the public. Newspapers, as they became stronger, could speak with utmost freedom and sincerity of purpose. Compare this performance of newspapers operated by free private enterprise with newspapers in countries dominated by governmental officials. In the dictator-ridden countries, I have seen how government dictates what shall and what shall not be published. In Italy, no word was permitted about the coronation of King George because Mussolini was offended by British attitude on Ethiopia. In Germany, during the recent crisis, the people were absolutely ignorant of what was going on. In Russia, not a word appears unless pressed by the censor. You have no conception 
of what it means to be in such darkness. During the purge in Berlin in 1934, not a name of anyone who was dragged from his home and murdered by government agents was printed. Thousands have been rushed off to concentration camps without knowledge of their relatives. Thank God our press would have told the facts and the public would have revolted. Furthermore, Americans do not undergo the humiliation of reading first in a foreign paper about events in their own country. Our press is not a gigantic government megaphone. Of course, a free press has flaws. Every freedom produces incidental, inevitable evil. Mere freedom from physical slavery produces some who want work. Freedom of organization for capital produces some corporations guilty of financial crime. Freedom of labor to organize produces some racketeering trade union. Freedom of religion produces some indifference to religion. A few sects seeming to others to be spiritually deplorable. Every freedom is an act of faith. Its outcome cannot be planned. Part of the outcome will be bad. But in a democracy, we are confident the good will outweigh the bad. So it is with all our freedoms. Let us be candid regarding freedom of the press. It produces some publishers and editors who put too much of their own bias into the news. Some who minimize one side of a news event, emphasizes another. Some who paint their enemies too black, their friends too white. Press freedom produces evil, at times perhaps great evils. Every freedom has to be operated by persons who by original and inherent human nature are imperfect. Even I am imperfect, according to Mr. Ickes. <laughs> Publishers are human beings who have their ideals, but also their frailties. What we must look at is not errors of individual publishers, but the total performance of the entire press. Looking at that performance the country over, no one can truly say our press is not both free and fair. I know the charges made by Mr. Ickes and others that our press, having been delivered from governmental control, is now controlled by the dollar, by vast business interests, using it for selfish advantage. This charge against the press is as a whole is ridiculous and silly. In the nation, there are 2,671. In the nation, there are 2,671 dailies and Sunday newspapers, 10,179 weeklies. Most of them are separately, individually owned in their own localities. No one man dominates or could dominate even a fraction of them. Ownership is too widely diffused. Domination is impossible. Again, intense competition prevails in newspaper publishing. Even when a newspaper has no local competition, it has competition from other cities. Our great metropolitan newspapers first compete with one another here, next with local newspapers on the smaller localities they invade. Newspapers published by chains are only about 3% at the most of all newspapers in the country. The newspapers also has radio competition, and it's a check on everything that's printed in the newspaper for that matter. All this competition not merely exists, but is increasing. Once we had only the one news gathering agency. Today we have three, the Associated Press, United Press, and the International News Service. They compete daily and diligently. First result of this competition is the reader has a wide choice. Where here in New York, newspapers range from outrightly communistic to uncompromisingly conservative. Second result is that every publisher lives in a state of competitive news fear. He does not know what his competitors will print. He must, therefore, print every news item of any consequence from any reliable local reporter or any press association. 
the publisher who habitually suppressed important news would sign his own slow death warrant. He seldom wishes thus to die. He may dislike Mr. Roosevelt. He may deplore Mr. Ickes. <laughs> he nevertheless... He nevertheless prints Roosevelt and Ickes' speeches. The public has a high regard for Mr. Ickes as an administrator. This has been gained... But this has been gained through the newspaper. There has been no suppression of Mr. Ickes, <laughs> nor, nor has there been, by and large, any general suppression of anybody or anything of substantial importance. I ask any critic, critic to prove one case. Now as to influence of advertisers. They are businessmen. They buy advertising to sell goods. They have no desire to please or influence the publisher. I know that from experience. They are in business, not in politics. The outcome proves they do not control the press. Even so frank a critic of the press as the New Republic admits it. In the last few years, business has been the subject of intense attack from official officialdom. Grave accusations have been made against business. Businessmen have been charged with serious faults, grave misdeeds. All this is fully known. But how? Because it has been reported in full in the newspapers. Some claim newspapers are controlled by their business offices, by advertisers' business offices, are wholly pro-business. But the newspapers, day by day, have printed column after column of anti-business accusations aimed against their best customers. When business evils have been exposed, they have been exposed principally through the newspapers. Attacked by the president, testimony often of hearsay in nature at legislative hearings, reports of commissions, investigating commissions, committees, House and Senate speeches, which are privileged and so immune from prosecution for slander or libel, through all these mediums, business has been adversely painted, sometimes only as humanly subject to error, again as diabolically conspiring against the very consumers it must satisfy. All this has been printed fully in the press. If business controls the press, certainly it had done a very poor job of it. If this is not a complete and final answer to allegations that newspaper operate under selfish dollar control, which suppresses news unfavorable to business. Of course it is. The patent fact is that the unfavorable anti-business news of Washington has been printed in billions of newspaper words. Once most American newspapers were subsidized organs of political groups, Little by little, our newspapers have achieved financial independence of subsidies and today live on their own incomes. Increasingly also, they have become independent of banks and similar influences. In my own case, and I wish I had time to expose how unfair this charge is about the international paper company, not the power company, paper company, a company which supplied us with paper with whom I had a business arrangement, Entirely, I didn't, it wasn't exposed to the government, I gave it out myself. But anyway, in my own case, in my own case, the whole common stock of the Gannett newspapers is owned by me and by the Gannett Newspaper Foundation, set up for charitable purposes. On this stock, <laughs> on this stock, on this stock, no bank, Outside corporation or individual has any lien, claim, or influence of any sort. And I'll challenge Mr. Ickes to find wherever in any of our papers the power trust was ever defended in one line when its interests were contrary to public welfare. <laughs> Thousands of other publishers are just 
in the same position as I am, absolutely independent. Increasingly, American newspapers are completely controlled by their own owners and managements responsible to those owners. It is only natural that newspapers, having attained such independence, should incur the antagonism and hatred of criticized office holders. What does all this hue and cry against the press mean? Why does Mr. Ickes, a member of the President's Cabinet, come from Washington and stand here tonight denouncing America's press as unfair and unfree? I will tell you why. It is because when President Roosevelt tried to break down the American Constitution by packing the Supreme Court... <laughs> Please let me have the time. Please let me have it. By packing the Supreme Court and reducing it to a yes court, the press stood up and fought honestly and courageously in editorial. <laughs> in editorials against the one man rule embodied in the iniquitous court bill. And they helped to defeat it. It is because the press bravely raised its voice of warning when three men chosen by Mr. Roosevelt drafted the original reorganization bill. No wonder editorial opinion of the press opposed it. For this extraordinary measure was written in such a spirit of contempt for democracy that it authorized Mr. Roosevelt that it authorized Mr. Roosevelt to abolish or change the name and functions of every office in the government, constitutional or otherwise. I have here with me a photostat copy of that original secret and amazing document which came hot from the White House to the Senate. And here is the provision, Title V, Section 501, authorizing the President to abolish or change the name and functions of the presidency itself. Perhaps Mr. Ickes would like to look at that. <laughs> Thirdly, it is because the press fought and beat the so-called May War Bill. It was in reality no war bill, for it went far beyond any measure ever devised in the interest of carrying on war. It clothed the president with complete economic dictatorship. It gave him power over everybody and everything. Their power to fix the price of everything bought, sold, or contracted for in this country. To fix all wages and compensation and to alter all annual or null all contracts. Yet the press fought that bill too and helped beat it. And it's, and it's uh, in a pigeonhole of the rules committee tonight. The press exposed and fought the misuse of relief funds for political purposes. And you see how that's developing. <clears throat> Rumors have been current that the president has for a long time <clears throat> intended to do something about the press. But until Senator Minton drew his press censorship bill, and he and Mr. Ickes and other White House spokesmen went on the rampage, no one knew from what sort the attack would come. What in reality does Mr. Ickes' proposition mean? Simply this, that after a period of agitation by government spoken, spokesmen, we may expect bills to be drafted and passed of such a nature that any newspaper that opposes the administration will be in danger of prosecution of some kind or of censorship. And this will bring about a situation where the one greatest essential of democracy, namely a free press, will no longer fearlessly inform the public about the public's business. Whereupon government propaganda, unrestrained and unchecked by newspaper vigilance, will become the people's main source of information. And speaking of propaganda, and I'm not talking about the light, legitimate bulletins of publications of departments explaining their work, I wonder if you people in this radio audience know what is going on in Washington. According to a reliable staff correspondent of a great and well-known daily, swarms of trained writers, press relations experts, directors of information, motion picture directors, playwrights, 
writers, film producers are busy at Washington flooding the country with propaganda. Washington correspondents receive an average, he reports, of 50 government releases a day, some illustrated with drawings and photographs. These releases may be free, but they're not fair. They give only the New Deal side of any question. <clears throat> Janet, I'm sorry. It looks like the radio audience is taking a good bit of your... I mean, the audience here is taking a good bit of your time, but our time is up. Perhaps you can cover that during the question period. Would you want to finish with the last... Paragraph? I should like to finish Please. with it. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's terribly unfair not to be able to conclude this address. But let us not stop. Uh, I want to quote two things from Mr. Ickes. Despite all these faults, America has the freest press in the world. Ask Mr. Icky. Before the Associated Press, April 22, 1935, he said, and I quote, The government knows that an America without a free press would no longer be the America that we have known and loved. In no country in the world is the press so free as it is in the United States. And I, for one, am glad. That's what Mr. Icky said. <laughs> And again, is the press free? Again, asked Mr. Icky. In that same address, he said, Overwhelmingly, the newspapers of the United States are ever conscious of their obligation to seek the truth and to tell it, regardless of whether or not they would prefer that the opposite be true. That's Mr. Icky. <laughs> Finally, isn't it about time? that we showed a little pride in our worthwhile institutions. Isn't it about time that we had an end to these vicious assaults on everything and everybody, including our free press? <laughs> and every paper, every patriot should cherish and defend our precious rights, including the freedom of the press, and for the publishers of America, I pledge you that we will fight on to maintain what, thank God, we now enjoy, a free press. <laughs> now I'm going to ask you, during the question period... Please remember that time is valuable and you take your own time from the discussion if you don't let the speakers continue speaking. Are we ready for the questions? Please, just a minute. Just a minute. <laughs> the benefit of the radio audience, I ought to tell you that the house is full. They're crowding the uh, galleries and the rafters and there are people upstairs around the building listening and there are a great many people with their hands in the... Now, waiting for questions, and I hardly know where to turn. All right, there you are. Question. Question to Mr. Denny. Yes? Why was the policy changed uh, to permit the personal abuse by a speaker supposed to discuss the matter? Yeah. The policy wasn't changed. I want to make this perfectly clear that there's a difference between an attack being made anonymously from the floor on an individual and a speaker whose identity is well known saying his say from the platform, you know exactly who he is, and the man he attacked is right here on the platform and can answer back. <laughs> the lady there. Mr. Gannon. Mr. Gannon. May I ask how you would explain the experience of Consumers Union, a non-profit organization, testing consumer goods and reporting on them in its monthly magazine, the advertising agencies don't thought to favor the existence of such an organization. And by a strange coincidence, it has been refused advertising space in most of the New York <laughs> newspapers. Yes, has the Consumers Union been refused advertising space in most of the newspapers, and if so, why? Mr. Gannett. I can't speak for all the papers in America, but every newspaper must scrutinize carefully the responsibility of any advertiser. It is it, under the libel... <laughs> Under the libel laws, it is subject to suit for a very large sum. And if this advertisement, which has been rejected, contains some statement on which somebody might bring action, the newspaper would have to defend it as if it had made the statement itself. Therefore, the paper is reluctant to take responsibility for an advertisement of which it is not sure. 
I know nothing about this consumer's ad. I've never seen one. None has ever been submitted to me. But if it were, I would certainly guard that point because the consumer's union does, of course, make certain statements that might be subject of great suit, and it would be very difficult for a newspaper to prove the authority for those statements. Thank you, sir. I'd like to ask Mr. Gannett what the actual circumstances were as to the ownership by the international paper company in his stock, answering the criticism that Mr. Akis made of that translation. That's a long story, and I don't care to go into all the details. The facts are that I had a contract for paper with the International Paper Company, had nothing to do with the power company. When money market was tight and I wanted to buy some newspapers, I found I had to pay a very exorbitant rate of interest, something like 15 or 16 percent in the banking community. The International Paper Company, which I was a large customer, offered to loan me the money at a lower rate. I bought that money and I sold them in exchange some of the preferred stock in some of these papers. Never at any time had they any control in any way of any of our publications. When a great ado was made about this great uh, fund that had been raised supposedly to control the press of America, I volunteered before the Federal Trade Commission. I wish you could read the testimony there. I told them all about the transaction. The next day, I paid off my obligations to the International Paper Company with a check which was immediately cashed. We're still doing business with the international paper company. But it is unfair, most unfair to intimate that because I had a business transaction with a paper company, with which I have been doing business for years, that that meant that they had some control over my editorial policies. Perfectly ridiculous. Is that actually true? Are there any newspapers or editors that you do like, Secretary? Oh, yes. Some, some that I don't approve of as editors, I'm very fond of as individuals. <laughs> and there are quite a lot of newspapers, too, that I approve of. I couldn't cover the ground in the time that I had. Take the New York Times. There isn't a better paper in the country than the New York Times. I doubt if there's a better paper in the world than the New York Times. You have here in New York the, the news run by Captain Joseph M. Patterson. During the last campaign, although he was supporting the New Deal, he gave equal space in his columns both to the Democratic and the Republican National Committee. The Chicago Times followed that example, which is an example that I might commend generally to newspapers everywhere regardless of politics. The Chicago Daily News is another first-class newspaper, although its publisher, Colonel Frank Knox, is vice president on the uh, Republican ticket. He allowed a columnist to, to criticize the Republican campaign and to, and to say he printed his column when he said that he didn't think that Frank Knox himself would make a good president. That, I think, was very fair. As, <laughs> St. Louis Post-Dispatch, the, uh, the uh, Christian Science Monitor, the uh, A. David, J. David Stern Papers. In fact, they're, they're quite a number throughout the country. Thank you. The lady on the front row in the balcony. Yes? Mr. Gannon. Mr. Gannon. Mr. Gannon, do you think it's a personal fact? Uh, you won the privileges of free press in 1936? It's the distortion of the facts, one of the privileges of a free press. The lady cites the... I don't think anyone distorts the facts deliberately. I don't think any real newspaper man does. There may be a misunderstanding of facts. No two people can report any accident exactly alike. Yet one would be a distortion of the facts in the eyes of the other. I don't know to what you refer about the 1936 campaign. Freedom of the press is freedom to print. You can print your paper, I can print one, anyone else can print one, and say what they please. 
And thank God we have that privilege in America. And for Mr. Eckes. Mr. Eckes, did you come here tonight to discuss a free press or to wreak vengeance on a newspaper man who happens to disagree with you? Yes, sir. That's the difference between an anonymous attack, a man that you don't know, you see, and an attack made by Mr. Ickes on Mr. Gannett, who is a publisher and who is here to answer whatever Mr. Ickes has to say. Now, that is a personal question. And please don't take advantage of the fair play that you're granted here by asking questions like that. No. No. Next question. Back there. Yes. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Ickes and Mr. Gannett both. If they are Ickes. both, I'd like to ask the Secretary, Mr. Gannett both, if they are both ignorant of the fact that the government does exercise censorship through the denial of second class privileges to political papers that the government does not approve of. Uh, Mr. Ickes, you heard the question, will you comment on it? Well, Mr. Gannett and I both seem to agree that the government doesn't attempt to exercise any control over the press, so... General has, has uh, uh, denied second-class privileges to socialist newspapers? <laughs> Mr. Hickey doesn't know. Mr. Gannett, would you comment on that? I, I don't know that the government has denied postal privileges to papers. Of course, the restrictions... Regulations of the post office department are very rigid, and there might have been an excuse for this uh, refusing male privileges. I don't know, but it's possible that it may be true. <laughs> Does Mr. Rickers know that the Federal Trade Commission report on the uh, uh, Gann on the uh, purchase of uh, securities and the Gannett and ma uh, many other uh, papers indicated its belief that the International Paper Company, which needed paper contracts, was trying to secure them. Told them that it should stop, and the International Paper Company did stop. I'm afraid we ought not to get into a discussion about that International Paper Company. And don't forget, it's the International Paper and Power Company. Oh, that's the name. Not the International uh, I, <laughs> Power. Do you want to comment on that, Mr. Gannon? No, I, all of my negotiations were the International Paper Company. And it is absolutely unfair to drag into it a power company which had nothing to do with the matter whatsoever. Mr. Gannett, Mr. Eckes, both, can we have peace in the family? <laughs> yes, we can have peace in the family and if we'd all approve of Mr. Eckes' New Deal papers, which he is... <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gannett. Lady, once please, I wonder why she came here. <laughs> How do you explain the fact that when the proposition for the child labor amendment was pending to the Constitution, that while the great thinkers of the country were divided uh, into two significant and large groups on both sides of the question, that the chain newspapers and the large papers were unanimous practically unanimous in opposition to the amendment. <laughs> I don't know that the newspapers were unanimously against it. I doubt that very much. Our papers, some of them, supported the child labor amendment and are still working for it. You should not include our papers in that category. But the newspapers were looking at it in a broad way. It's, a, it's preposterous to think the newspapers opposed that amendment because of the newsboy regulation, nothing of the sort. There are great many people in this country that are opposed to the child labor amendment. 
the fact that it has not yet been ratified by enough states to make it a law proves that the majority are against that amendment. There's an honest difference of opinion about child labor legislation. This question for Mr. Ickes. <laughs> Mr. Ickes, in a free representative republic, isn't it a fact that our press, exactly as it is, is far more to be desired in the interests of freedom and liberty than a press dominated and dictated to by any political power, any political party in power? Oh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> but... We would also be better off if it were not dominated and dictated to by financial and advertising interests. Mr. Gannett, you stated that the radio is acting as a check for newspapers. Since the radio is owned by the same business interests that control the newspapers, how do they act as a check? Oh, that, that is simply ridiculous, that's all. The newspapers don't own the radio station. They're owned by the great chains. The newspapers have nothing to do with them. There are hundreds of private stations that newspapers have nothing to do with whatsoever. But naturally... When the news goes out in these various forms, it's competition. It's a check on the accuracy of the report. One newspaper is a check against the other. Radio is a check against all newspapers. It's serving a good purpose. We're all glad that it's here. Thank you. Lady there. Yes? Mr. Hickey and Mr. Kenny, I, I would like to have both of you uh, release of this terrible tension of our freedom of speech and, and press. I happen to be a foreigner, and I know that there is no such a thing in Europe as freedom of press, and this country surely has, and I'm so proud to be here, and know that you all have a chance to, to uh, opinion your voice. And I feel that this is the only country in the world that you can be proud of, or uh, anybody else. Thank you, young lady. <laughs> lady on the back row back there. fight against the Roosevelt administration, you employed a former German agent and ex-convict. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. That's not relevant. Yes? Secretary Ickes? Yes. Uh, Mr. Ickes mentioned that he had other examples of newspaper suppression. Will you please cite some of them? In about a minute and a half, Mr. Ickes, will you do that? Our time is more than up right now. Well, one or two that I couldn't get into my speech. There was a chauffeur in the department, uh, serving in a department store in Boston, driving across Copley Square, he jumped the ditch and decapitated two men. The story of that extraordinary and sensational accident didn't appear in any Boston newspaper except the Boston transcript. But don't jump to conclusions. The Boston transcript carried no advertising of that particular department store. When there was a public uh, outcry against the salary of two million dollars and the bonus that President Hill of the American Tobacco Company paid himself, according to my information, he sent a 900-word telegram to every newspaper publisher reminding him uh, the amount of money that the company had paid in advertising the next year and holding out hopes of still further largest in the future. I understand that at Johns Hopkins University, there's a very sensational finding resulting from the study of the effect of cigarette smoking. It has not appeared, so far as I know, in any newspaper in the United States. I wonder if that is because the tobacco companies and the cigarette companies are such large advertisers. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and thank you, Mr. Gannett. I think it's a great tribute to you both 
who have appeared here on the platform together in real town meeting fashion to discuss this important public question. And I hope that we may have you both back again. As, as we've already stepped over our time, we'll have to turn the meeting over to our radio listeners and our town meeting discussion groups throughout the country. As you know, we have a town hall advisory service which supplies 12 different services to discussion groups for the cost of providing and mailing them. We're going to experiment during the last half of this season for a period of 13 weeks and we'll send for the cost of one dollar services 9, 10, and 11 which consists of a bibliography of suggested reading prepared by the Reader's Advisor Service of the New York Public Library biographical sketches of all the speakers and a statement of the background and issues of each program sent one week in advance. This special offer is made only for the half season beginning February 9th, but is available to all listeners whether they are members of a group or not. Now, Mr. Cross, will you tell us about the program for next week and where we may write for services and copies of tonight's program? Mr. Cross. Next week at this hour, the question, Is America Menaced? by foreign propaganda, about which so much comment has recently appeared in the newspapers, will be discussed. The speakers will be Channing Pollock, well-known playwright and author, Earl Browder, General Secretary of the Communist Party, USA, J.B. Matthews, one of the principal witnesses before the Dyes Committee and author of The Odyssey of a Fellow Traveler, and Morris L. Ernst, leading liberal attorney who is counsel for the Newspaper Guild. The speeches and discussion heard on tonight's program will be printed in Town Meeting, the Bulletin of America's Town Meeting of the Air, published weekly by the Columbia University Press, and containing not only the questions and answers heard in Town Hall itself, but comments from listeners as well. Copies are available at a nominal charge of 10 cents, or the entire series of 26 broadcasts may be subscribed for now and received weekly at a cost of $2.50. Send your orders to Town Hall... 123 West 43rd Street, New York City. Town Hall, 123 West 43rd Street, New York City. Our meeting next week, our meeting next week, is America menaced by foreign propaganda. Our meeting next week. This is the National Broadcasting Company.